Bowling to batting and a bit of a star turn. Both Michael Vaughan and Joe Root were not strong kids and hitting the ball off the square was a real challenge in their youth. Both played for Sheffield Collegiate Cricket Club and we went and eavesdrop on them at Abbeydale Park discussing how they cope with life as a youngster. Root on debut, massive decision, huge decision from England selectors this morning. Yeah, Joe Root is our man. No Johnny Bairstow, no, no, in Morgan. Samit Patel dropped. It's a great chance for this young man. I'll never forget getting off the mark in Test cricket on my, on my debut. Good confident start for Joe Root. First Test runs for him. Having someone quite positive at the other end and energetic gave me sort of that buzz to install it into my own game almost. And uh, I think that in a way helped helped um, get off to a decent start. Do you remember what it was like when you were 11? Yeah, you didn't really think much about technical stuff, more about hitting the ball and scoring as many runs as you can. And when you, when you say hitting the ball, scoring as many as you can, in comparison to the other players, what size were you? Tiny. I was always very small and I always found it quite hard to get it off the square and to you know, consistently hit boundaries unless it was a lot of pace on the ball or whatever. So one thing that I always tried to do was just make sure I could stay in for long periods of time, otherwise, you know, I wouldn't score the runs that the other lads would because, you know, they'd they would hit boundaries and I and I just wouldn't. From say the age of six to eleven playing in the garden, yeah. would your dad like be Definitely. in the garden saying your grip, Definitely. your back lift? That's one thing you you don't really think about at all, but the people that you know are coaching you and helping you out and put I think I have to put a little bit more time and emphasis on in trying to groom certain things and get good habits uh, in from an early age. I think my dad, more than anything, as soon as he saw me and my brother coming through, he wanted to uh, get involved and try and help out. I remember playing an under-13s game on the top pitch, 12, 13 years old, I wanted to bowl as fast as I could. And I remember giving him my jumper, giving him my cap, and bowling my first ball the over, and he gave it a no ball. It was nowhere near the front line. It, it was just a normal delivery outside off stump. And he said, well, you didn't tell me you're bowling right arm over. So he, he was always quite harsh on me, but he just wanted to make sure that he, like, I knew what was going on, I knew the rules, I knew how to do it, and he was, wasn't afraid of me getting it wrong initially to, to then get it right. So was your dad in the garden, like tennis balls, just thrown to you all the time with your brother? Yeah, just little things like underarms at five or six year old, perhaps in foot cover drive, and he'd like, get your foot near the ball, try and stand on the ball. I remember times when I'd actually stand on the ball. Did you encourage your brother, or was there like a, a real healthy competition? Yeah, there's always healthy competition. Times when we were young where uh, we'd be playing on the sideline and my dad would have a league match. We were up at Scarborough once and um, we were playing in the nets and for, for once he got to bat first. And I got him out early and he just lost it, chasing me around the ground with his bat. And my dad, they had to stop the Yorkshire League game and he had to come and break us up. So <laughs> there was a healthy competition there. I'd have been playing for the seconds or the first team out in the middle, probably with his dad. And Billy and Joe, the two blonde-haired brothers, would be just playing in the dressing rooms, picking up bats, always in the nets in the corner over there. You know, Billy would be bowling his leg spin, playing every shot in the book, and then the little scrawny kid to my left here would be playing every defensive shot in the book. And all the club would be saying, oh, you know, Billy's got all the talent, you know, he's going to go all the way. And I remember to this day saying, nah, scrawny lad's going to be the one. He's got a bit of ten. He's got that inner steel. I could see there was something inside him. But to see two young kids playing on the outfield and being really competitive with it as well, you know, they hate you getting out. You know, we're always arguing. Very similar to me and my brother. We'd do exactly the same. Where, you know, you just want to bat all day. You don't want to get out. Particularly, you don't want to get out to your brother. And that's exactly what those two were like. Well, that's nice. Forward defensive. That's that channel. That's the channel. <laughs> Dangerous in there. Brian Harris will bowl you a delivery. You're playing missing. You smile. Yeah. Did you used to smile when you were no, in there? No, I used to get annoyed, kick the ground sometimes or whatever. Well, let's see if we can get you to play and miss again. I think just on that, playing and missing, sometimes uh, on a pitch that is doing a bit, it is actually better than making contact with it because it means that you're holding your position, you're not following the ball and you play in the line and sometimes you've got to accept that that's as good as blocking it because it's the same result at the end of the day. You know, if you do follow it, you, you're getting yourself in bad positions and bad habits. But I think at times it can help you, thinking, all right, I've done everything right there and he's just bowled a good ball.
you were tiny, weren't you? And yeah. thin like me, I was, a, I was yeah. a little rake as well. Now putting a helmet on for the first time when you're that size, I mean, they're quite, quite chunky. I know that you'll have this large size because you're an adult, but how did you cope the first time you got a helmet on? Well, I think I was about seven or eight, something ridiculous like that. Um, and I'd just never played a hardball game before, so I'd never worn a helmet. So I went in at three, and I was that first ball. I couldn't see a thing, the helmet was going all <laughs> over the place. I got told off because I was using it as an excuse when I came off by my dad, but um, yeah, it's one of those things that you just got to get used to. Right, here's some more. In the summer holidays especially, me and my brother would come down here because, I mean, we only lived around the corner, but we'd always be pestering for lifts to get get down here with the kit and we'd be b throwing balls at each other and bowling at each other in the nets and we'd just play all day. Um, it's generally how we spent our summer holidays. What did you feel when you suddenly had a coach telling you, you know, other things to do in the game? It was nice to, to get sometimes a, a different insight into things. But at the same time, well, I always thought about, you know, what, what works best for me and what's, you know, if I, I'll practice everything and then just try and take the things that I know work. So you what, did that when you were 11? You knew yeah, that at that, well, that age? You knew that different people would be telling you all sorts and you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Um, but I think you just naturally listen to the, the people that you respect the most and um, you think have the, you know, the most knowledge. I don't think I got that till about, I reckon I was 21, 21, 22, when I, you know, you get that much information fed to you. You know, as a kid, I would always think that it was right. I would go, hey, you must be right, coaches. You know, you're coaching me. You must be telling me exactly what I need to do. And I think I got lost a little bit from the age of 13 to 16, in particular, with so much information being fed to me through all the different coaches. Well, for me, I remember um, getting a scholarship at Yorkshire when I was about 12 years old, 13 years old. And from then on, I got a lot of people telling me lots of different things. And uh, I just sort of realised that you know that all it can't all work because they're all telling me. Oh, a lot of them are telling me completely different things and opposite things. So I think it was more about trying to find or try try everything. And then um, if if I, if that I was hitting the ball better with that, or um, my footwork was sharper doing that, then try and put those into my game somehow. So you got no on your first game. You obviously kind of store that up in the memory bags. The next time you go out and play, were you very good at learning from mistakes on the pitch? At that age, I wasn't, it wasn't one of those things where you think, oh, I've, not, I've got a low score, I've got to score runs. You just go out and you play and you, you don't think, you just think you're going to score runs all the time. What age very, did you play for Yorkshire from? Uh, under 11s. Right. Um, I remember getting run out in my first game for about 10. And I, felt, I, I thought I was going to score 100. I got hit my first ball for four. Where, when did you score your first 100? I was 11, I think. Um, it was a 20 over game, there was a ridiculous short boundary on one side. And you were still one of the smallest? Yeah. Um, but could you hit it, even though you were one of the smallest, did you, feel, did you feel that you could still hit it quite hard because you had the right technique? My dad always tried to, talk, to speak to me about timing um, and that was always one thing that I tried to, to work on and it's quite hard to explain how, how it happens but um, like you say, I think if you groom uh, you, the basics well, it's one of those things that naturally comes. Let's groom some more basics. When did you get your first bouncer? That's a big thing as a kid, isn't it? When you start getting the odd ball whistling past your head. I think that first Yorkshire game was the first one I got. Under 11s? Yeah, there was a big lad who was a lot bigger than the rest of us. I remember the, their keeper was tiny as well. And every time he got the ball from the boundary, he'd be shouting, easy groom! Because <laughs> like, he'd it'd knock him over every time because he had a, an arm that was far, a lot stronger than everyone else's. And Yeah, I think that was one thing that Again, you just play, and I, obviously I was small all the time, so I think I got a few more than everyone else. Then. Did, um, did you practice facing the bounce, or did it just happen naturally? Me and my brother would be on the outfield at times. If it, if it rained, we'd get a wind ball out, and we'd just try and launch it as hard as we could at each other. We'd be batting with a stump, and you'd, you'd try, and smack, try and take a few on, and yeah, that was always great fun. So I played men's cricket from a young age. So there's the fifth team down here, for example. And I played on this pitch. Yeah, exactly. Same here. You collegiate, come down and collegiate force against university staff. Uh, Ten off yeah. eighty-one balls. Yeah, five not out off twenty <laughs> overs. Um, but 
because of their natural height and and you know, a bit stronger or whatever, um, it does come through this height a bit more. And I think that's where naturally I learned to play the shorter ball is from playing men's cricket. What age did you play from um, in the men's team from? I think my first game I was nine, ten years old. Um, what in the in the men's? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. They were short and they needed a fielder, so I went along and tried to help out. Uh, and I ended, up, we ended up, <laughs> I ended up having to go in at the end. I think I got nine not out off about ten overs. One of them um, <laughs> got me in the ribs. Everyone rushed over, quite concerned, because obviously I was a young lad. And the umpire said afterwards that if they'd have appealed, he'd have had to give me out. That be. <laughs> what was the best tip that you got from a coach when you were young? Good question. I think watch the ball generally. Uh, I think another big one was actually playing in a second team game. I think it might have even been your brother that I was batting with at the time. Big Dave. Big Dave, yeah. I kept playing and missing and getting quite upset with myself and he was just kept coming down to me and just saying, don't worry about that, just think about the next ball. And I think that's one big big bit of advice that always has sort of big, stuck big, with big me. David Bonds had a... Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that because it was one thing that you know, really stood out and from then on I've always tried to think if I am struggling, just keep that in the back of my mind. Dave would always ring me on a Saturday night and say, oh, we've played a game and Joe's done this. He'd always ask me for a little bit of, a, of, of advice if, if for what he should be saying and I'd just say, oh, it's time to enjoy it. You know, as long as you're watching the ball, as long as you're really committing to every single shot that you're playing, commit to it, do it well, enjoy it. You never know, you might end up being pretty good at it. What about hitting it too hard when you were little? That was probably my biggest downfall. You tried to? Always being small, I always thought I've got to try and hit fours. That's why I think it was so important. My dad always telling me to try and time the ball. And that's obviously held me in good stead growing up and later down the line it came in very handy when a lot of other lads were working on technical things. I could just play because I'd put all that hard work in as a young lad. As a kid sometimes I'd get frustrated and. Yeah, you practice trying to hit it over the boundary. I think you've got to practice that. And you, you don't even reach mid-on sometimes as a 10-year-old kid. But So you go in the nets, you practice it, you get so annoyed with yourself because you can't do it. But you always want to practice it and get better at it. But when you say you couldn't do it, would you just keep going until you could do it? Yeah, definitely. That was always one thing I tried. And all the lads, all, the, all my mates that came down and uh, to the nets with me would start to get irritated with me because... I'd been pestering him to throw balls at me or bowl at me for longer. Or the coaches, they would be the same. I mean, Josh will tell you, he was one of them. <laughs> throw a few more. You're up to your 50th thousand throw to Joe Root. Oh, you got him. You've got him. Did you, do you know the, the step up to men's cricket? I always found that, that was my kind of moment. It almost felt then that I had to grow up, I had to mature quickly. Do you find it the same? I think when I started playing second team and first team cricket down here at about 13, 14, 15, that's when it started to become you know, really challenging and um, I remember the first three or four years thinking, this is, this is really hard, I'm not scoring any runs. You then get blokes saying, who are trying to help you out, saying, no, come and sit down and watch and learn. And, and you start watching the game and seeing how different people go about different things and you do get nervous, you think, oh, this guy's quick. Talk of a dressing room when someone's quick. Yeah. It's never as quick as you think. When no, it's there. not. It's not. But yeah. I think sometimes that prepares you well because you actually get out there and you think, oh, it's not that bad. Um, if you can just make sure you don't, you're not too petrified by the time you get out there. Have you, have you ever been scared? Uh, I'd say so, yeah. I think it would be wrong to say you're not, not scared. I remember the first game for you know Yorkshire first team, walking out to bat, I was petrified. That's the only time I've really been nervous. Was it, was it a fear of being hurt or a fear of getting out and failing? Um, yeah, I think more the second. I know people say you should never have that feeling, but it's one thing that I sort of, it helped me d develop and want to improve because you don't want to feel like that. So uh, I'd say there is a little bit of a place for it as long as you don't let it get to you too much. The basics don't change. Head still, real good strong base, stillness on impact. You know, I just think whatever size you are, you see some of the you know, the best players in the world in this era, they're only small, but they can whack it miles because they have time and they have that strong base and they commit to the shot. You know, so I think size, in actual fact, in this era is, is probably as irrelevant as, as any era. You know, I think in the 90s, actually, real power and strength was more important. 
Now, whereas now with all these new trick shots, the ramp in particular has brought a, a new dimension to someone who particularly couldn't hit it straight down the ground for six. You know, five, ten years ago, that wasn't in the game. You know, so everyone would be able to, particularly captains, would be able to defend a certain area of the pitch to someone that only could hit in one area. Now these new shots has brought a new innovation, and it's almost given life for the the young scrawny kid. You know, ten and eleven now with these little ramps and tricks. You just use the pace on the ball, it's, it's great for kids. What, what about all these new shots that we've seen in the last, I'd say, seven or eight years, because of 2020 more so? The ramp, the reverse. Was it you that decided that you had to play those shots to, again, put yourself at the top bracket of being an international player? I think so. I think it started two years ago, really, when um, I wanted to get in the Yorkshire 2020 team. And I, I wasn't, wasn't hitting large amounts of fours and sixes and I needed to try and find a way of scoring a strike rate of over 100 and think right I'm going to have to do something slightly different to to score here. I think the main thing when you're playing these shots is you've just got to back yourself and be brave and when you practice it to, to break it right down. Let's start with a reverse sweep. Let's go right from the start. How did you start to coach yourself? I think more than anything you, is you're getting in position for it. I think the uh, first time I did it was Kevin Sharp, and he got me in a position like this, and he'd literally be throwing me under arm ball. And just say, right, just get, get yourself in a position that you would sweep in. Say, right, I want you to do it. But I want you to get your hands right round your front leg, lean over and make good contact that way. And just little underarm feeds, half volleys. Then you take it back, um, and you, you say, right, get in your stance. I want you to get down into the position and make contact with the ball like that. And then eventually you'd add a bowler in, do it, try and do it every ball to the bowler, see what which shot so you'd you be can. So you'd be missing a few, you'd be yeah, top edging a few, you'd be getting, few, you'd be getting hit on the yeah. head, yeah. And then eventually when you were getting it right the majority of the time, you'd say, right, um, I want you to play the bowler normally. And then every now and again, if it's in the right area, I want you to play the shot. Even with the shots that, like this, that, that you need your head to be in a good position to play them well. And I think the best way of doing that is by learning the basics um, and, and developing it from there. So... I think, yeah, it's the time and a place when you should go out and, and practice everything you can and, and have fun with it and, and do what you can. And, but those basics generally um, will stand, stand you in good stead in whatever shot you play. like it. Come on, Josh. What about when you were, were you actually growing? How difficult did you find batting when you, know, you start at this height and you grow a few inches? Yeah. And you know, balance can be, well, it was a problem for me when I was growing up, tall, thin lad. Ed was kept on falling over to cover. I actually had a really big problem with it. I just signed my professional contract, had a really good year in the academy, scored a lot of runs in the second team for Yorkshire. And my first year on the staff, um, I think my first two months I got about 10 runs, averaging 10 or five or something stupid like that. And I thought, this is, you know, I'm not, I'm really struggling here. I'm not gonna, even I'm gonna get dropped from the second team, the academy team I was scoring no runs in, I was thinking, it's hard work this and I remember Kevin Sharp just laughing at me. I think more than anything the way he went about it, if I struggle for example, a lot of the time he'd just laugh it off and he'd just say don't worry, it's, he, just, he used to say the good Lord's testing you and it's one of those things that it's, it's like a cir circle almost where it's, there are going to be times when you, you're on the top and everything's going fantastically well for you and you know he gradually go, goes against you and before you know you're at the bottom, it's just how quick you can then get back to the top and how long you can stay at the top for. So I think he was always trying to find ways of, of helping me do that and understand that. He always talked about um, when I was at the top, remembering the times when I didn't score runs and you know the same um, when it was the other way around. I, I remember that winter I'd grown, I think, uh, six inches, which is obviously quite a lot. And, I remember going away, having a few months off like in the winter, coming back at Christmas, and my setup, it felt completely bizarre. I mean, I was leaning further down to put my bat on the floor, my eyes were over here, I was going like this, was all over the place, picking my bat up over here, and I had to completely remodel my, my stance and uh, my setup, and it took me a couple, three or four months, really. I mean, firstly, to and work well, that, that was purely down to growth? Yeah, I think so. I think as well, when you, once you get you, you get a few low scores, you you start thinking about things a little bit. But that natural growth was quite a big part in it. And I uh, remember, I think I got LB eight, eight out of ten times. 
just purely because I was falling over. How did you sort it out? To start with, find something that did work, um, because I, I did feel that I had to change something. Um, and I, I tried certain things that they didn't work to start with and tried to stick with them and then thought, right, that's not working, we're going to try something else. Stuck with that and found that that did help. Um, whatever it was, whether it be just standing slightly wider, so had a bit more, was more of a solid base and um, I wasn't, you know, too, too, uh, too narrow, so I would fall over. So the, the wider stance has, has helped you uh, with slightly. your balance? Yeah, I think so. How long have you put your bat in between your legs on stance? Since then. I always used to bat with it here, um, growing up. And I think it got to about that, that stage, about 18, 19 years old. And I had to start putting it in between, just purely because I'd, I'd grown. And uh, I couldn't put it behind anymore because I'd have to stand there with my eyes like this. So it's I a good tip, that. Because, so you've, you've become a pro, yet yeah. you've realised that you need to change, even though you've had become a pro already. Yeah, I think That's so. And I, I think there's a lot of things that even from then have changed. Mm. Well, so what about your balance on either foot? Um, I think I've always tried to keep it pretty neutral. Um, obviously, you want to try and keep your head going towards the ball and your eyes as level as possible. But um, I think, if anything, if you, can, if you get too far back here, then you know, you're never going to get weight into drives. At the same time, if you're heavy over your front foot, you can't get a big stride in because you know you can't really move from there and at times you can get a bit stuck up here if, if they go hard at your head so I think it's trying to stay as neutral as you can so you, you can um, push off each foot. See that's, that's, I would say that's you. So you kind of look to get forward Yeah. but then as soon as you feel that you can go on the back foot you'll always err going that way. Yeah definitely. Have you, is that again? Is that something you've always done? Yeah, I think, like I said earlier, playing men's cricket from a young age, the majority of the balls, good length for a man, were short for me. So I ended up facing a lot of balls on the back foot, um, and as well, that was the easiest way for me to score because I could, I could put more mm. power into it, with uh, cut shots and pull shots especially. So it's always been my way of looking to, to, to score quickly. How were you if you'd not score for three, four, five overs? Because I used to get frustrated. I used to like feel I was letting the team down. Yeah, you know, I was so looking at the scoreboard, it's not moving, my score's not moving, the team score's not moving. I'd be like, oh no, I've got to play something here. That always went through my mind as well, but and the, the team that we played in, we were never very good. Um, we always ended up on the bottom end of the league and majority of the time I'd be coming in trying to play for a draw, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> um, but just have to dig in. Yeah, exactly, and just bat for as long as you could. And I think that was obviously helped me because I spent more time out there, faced more balls. And what about the uh, the chirping side? I think it's a part of the game. You've got to accept that it's there. And the sooner you can you can sort of embrace it and try and find a way to get over it. Whether you, if you're quite an aggressive person, you might want to go back at them because uh, it might get you in a, a good frame of mind to to play well. But I mean, I always just try and smile and laugh it off and try and make them feel stupid, because that's always worked for me. If I'm making them say stuff at me, then I'm obviously doing something that they don't like. Used to be a guy who used to play for Rotherham. He once bowled me a ball, right? Played and miss. And I was just smiling at him and he was abusing me, and I kept my position like this, smiling. The wicketkeeper got the ball, realised that my foot was out of my crease, and I was just kind of chirping, smiling back. Keeper threw it at my stumps. He ran out. I was out by a yard. <laughs> Playing as a 10 year old, you'd arrive on a ground like this and you'd be crying if it rained because you're going to miss a game's cricket. So you'd be desperate, you know, with your mum and dad, oh, when's the next game? And, you know, the more you play and you become a pro and then you go and play for England, you like look to the clouds and go, oh, come on, I won't mind a rain day. You know, I think you've somehow got to keep that under 10s feeling in your, in your body through your whole of your career, that excitable, kind of nervous uh, feeling that you have and, you know, the desperation to want to get out on the field and play cricket. It was always nice to know that, that someone from the club had gone on and played for England. You know, I'd be watching the telly down here, for example, in the bar, having trained or whatever, and Vaughan would be on it playing for England. And I'd, I'd think, right, you know, I, I could do that one day. Uh, and it just gave me that little bit of self-belief that it was possible. Well, they both made some excellent points. Very interesting listening to Michael and to Joe. I thought it was particularly interesting listening to Joe talk about the information imparted to him as a young man by coaches. When do you impart information to try and help a kid and when do you have to sit back 
and let him learn on his own. Can you impart too much information? That